This morning is from the book of Ephesians. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body of armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, <coughs> Hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right word so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love and faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <coughs> These are, you heard Paul's final words. They weren't his last words, but they were his farewell. And here's Jesus' final words. Again, not his last words, but a word of farewell and comfort to his disciples. John chapter 14, begin at verse 23. Jesus said, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you, I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I'm going to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I saw a cartoon in the local paper here this week um, that really helped set the stage for this message, especially reflecting on Paul's final words from prison. And uh, it's a cartoon that has a big looming figure of Vladimir Putin. It has Putin here. And then below him, in his kind of in his two hands, there's an elephant and a donkey. And there's expletives that have been replaced with symbols and some angry looks at each other. And the little caption says, when Putin dreams. When Putin dreams. So I think that's a perfect analogy to what the adversary is doing. The adversary loves to see Christians fight, 
loves to see churches torn apart by conflict, loves to see denominations pointing fingers. That's really what Paul's talking about from prison. He's been in prison for two years probably. Uh, it's probably in Rome, probably, I say, say probably, we don't know for certain. At the end of his life, he probably has come to terms with the fact that he's not gonna live, that if he does get out, he's gonna be executed, and he may never get out. But instead of feeling sorry for himself or talking about where's God in all this or why is this happening, the whole letter of Ephesians has been one of encouragement to the churches outside. Be strong, don't worry about me, I'm fine. This is a testimony to God's power. You just keep focusing on God's word, on Jesus. Just don't let the adversary start pitting you against each other. Church, um, agree to disagree on the things you don't agree with, but keep focused on Jesus. Because the adversary, the devil, Satan, um, is a strong and powerful presence. Now, in our time, um, and I'm one of them, oh, I don't believe in the devil, a red demon with uh, pointed ears and a pitchfork and walking around stalking people. Nobody believes in that. That's a cartoon figure. And part of the problem when we say that is that we also tend to forget that there is a kind of adversarial presence that embodies itself in vulnerable human beings and congregations and stirs up trouble. I believe, as Paul said, our enemies are not one another. Our enemies are the powers and principalities of the evil one. Now, I used to kind of discount that, ah, you know, there's no devil, there's no... But how do you explain some of the evil things that go beyond just human failings? There is a force of evil that is active, but not stronger than the force and power of God in Christ. And Paul is saying, his final words really are, be um, put on your armor against this. It's a very military image, clearly, and I learned something this past week that I had never known or thought about, that Paul is in this cell, again, for a couple of years, probably, and he's not alone in the cell. He's alone in terms of being a prisoner, but some commentators say after an earlier prison break, Chapter 16 of Acts has Paul and Silas in prison, and there's an earthquake, and there could have been a prison break, except Paul back in Acts 16 says, no, I'm not gonna escape. I want you to pay for this. I'm a Roman citizen. You can't put me in jail, or they've already scourged him and beat him uh, with whips and so on. So he had a chance to escape, and he didn't. And the jailer just said, I'm in big trouble now. And he says, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna insist on my rights. Anyway, he could have had a prison break. So after that, I read that some say that he was, Paul was literally handcuffed to a Roman soldier 24 seven. So he wasn't alone, he had an escort at all times in prison. I'd never heard that before and I don't know um, what to make of it, but I thought, okay, that makes sense. Here's Paul chained to this poor Roman soldier who's saying, why did I get this duty? I'm a prisoner too. And I imagine Paul saying, you know what, I don't blame you, Roman soldier. You're, you're doing your job. I want to tell you about a power greater than the Roman Empire. His name is Jesus. Let me tell you about him. I imagine Paul found opportunity to convert a whole lot of his Roman guards and a lot of people who um, could see that in Paul there was really some power even in chains. Paul says, I'm an ambassador in chains that they didn't have. The Roman Empire with all of its dominance did not have. And I can imagine Paul in that cell, got plenty of things to think about, looking over at that soldier next to him and saying, let me tell you what the life in Christ is like. He said, the way we arm ourselves is we put on, uh, we, we put on the belt of truth. Let me tell you about that, that's about Jesus. And we put on the breastplate of righteousness uh, and we put on the helmet of salvation, and we put on the shoes of peace that bring the good news, and we put on the shield of faith that protects us from the devil's fiery arrows. Paul's just translating military categories into where the real power is. And I imagine Paul, when they were saying, you should be pretty worried here because good things are not gonna happen for you. You're a prisoner. And Paul's saying, you can kill my body, but you can't kill the message and you can't kill the promise of the gospel.
That's what I imagine is going on in there. Paul's witnessing by his being at peace despite his external circumstances. Well, the last words, there have been a lot of themes of last words or final words this, or farewell this past week. We had uh, Senator McCain buried yesterday. Now that I'm leaving, I will tell you I voted for the man. I didn't think he was the best candidate, but he proved with his life of dedication to this country and his faith that maybe he ought to have a chance. Well, if he had a better room, uh, running mate, he might have had a chance. But as it is, President Obama came, and I think we, even if you disagreed with him, I think we'd have to, to say that some really good things happened there, too. God knows what God's doing. But, I, uh, but Senator McCain's a, uh, an amazing person. It's amazing how all the people who didn't think so much of him now are just praising him as they should for his witness in his life. They call him the maverick. I think, well, how much of a maverick is he, really? He's the grandson of a Navy admiral, the son of a Navy admiral. He went to the Naval Academy, captain in the uh, Navy, shot down over Vietnam, imprisoned, doing his duty, and here he is in prison after one year, and you may know this story. I forgot until I reread it. In his Hanoi Hilton, they offered him, they opened the gates, said, your prison doors are open, you can go home. And he said, not unless my men can go home. And they said, well, we're not gonna do that. You can go home now. And he said, no, I'll stay. And he stayed for four more years. What do you think about when you're in prison for four years in the Hanoi Hilton? What do you think about? Well, you could think about how miserable you are and how terrified you are and how um, you don't even want to go on living or I'll never get out of here and you can despair. Or you can say, and I don't know what he thought and prayed. He's a good Baptist, grew up Episcopal, good Baptist. I'm thinking he probably said, you know what, God's given me gifts. And my parents and my grandparents, they use their gifts, considerable gifts, to bless people through their leadership gifts. And when I get out of here, if I get out of here, when I get out of here, I'm gonna use my gifts. And he apparently thought his gifts were as a senator in Arizona, and I don't know, 30 some years, I don't know how many years, I read it and I forgot now. He's not perfect, and you may not have agreed with him. I didn't agree with him on all things, but here's a man who spent time in prison, had a chance to get out, and said, you know, I'm not going to do it. There's a higher calling, and uh, my men are the higher calling, and I'm not going to do it. And he got out, and he could have just said, now I deserve to just go. He had plenty of money, apparently. Could have just gone and golfed every week in Arizona or whatever, but he felt the call to be a leader. His final word seems to me at that service, I, I don't have a TV, so I can't watch it. I read excerpts online, but his final word was by the people he picked to speak. He picked Obama, he picked George W. Bush, he picked Lieberman, the Democrat. He picked, um, who else did he have? Well, his daughter had a wonderful testimony. And I think the message that came by is, you know what, we have disagreements, we have political disagreements, but you know what? We're really one people. We, th this country is greater than our differences. We can't keep fighting over petty things. I think the people he chose to, um, his old friends uh, from, from his past journeys, some of which were on the other side of the aisle and admitted they, they were, weren't always in agreement. I think by the way he prepared his own funeral, he's saying, come on folks, this is a great nation under God. We can get along, we have our differences. I think that's his final words. And that, what a great thing to be remembered for. Carter seems to be doing that with his life, and he certainly wasn't the most beloved president at the time. We had you know, lots of things going on, but um, again, this is not political. This is just saying they're, they're leaders who said, we need to remember who we are as Americans. And for Christians, we need to remember who we are as Christians and stop fighting with each other. Paul said, our disagreements are not with one another. Our enemy is not one another. It's the adversary who just knows how to stir the pot. We had Aretha Franklin. What a wonderful lady. Used her gifts. Lady grew up in Detroit, a black woman. What an amazing gift of music that she used. If you know some of her songs, you know, respect. Could we use respect now? Wow, what a message she written in the 60s, I suppose. And then that, I'll say a little prayer for, for you. Eh, a little ditty, you know. I think th that from what I've read about her, I don't know that much about her other than music, she was also one who not only had a gift, but wanted to bring people together. 
through her gift of music. We've all been gifted uniquely. We don't have to compare our gifts to other people. We do have to use them to bring people together. That's what the church's mission is about, bring people together. My time here has been six and a half months. Um, sometimes it seems a lot longer. I don't mean that in, in, in the way you might think. I think it's only been six and a half months um, going from zero to 660 or whatever. But So I've learned some things about this congregation that I want to impart. Um, my job has really been to prepare for the next person and to help you prepare for the next phase of ministry. Um, a lot of things have been left undone and a lot of things could have been done better, but this is a good congregation. This is a good congregation. I'm surprised at how often I hear the kind of um, um, congregation bashing. Like, oh, you know, we used to have all these people here. We used to have this. I said, yeah, you know what? Those days aren't coming back. Not in the same way anyway. Thanks be to God. We, we romanticize earlier areas. When we're honest, we say, well, there were things that were really good about earlier times, and you know what? They're really great things now, and God's got a future for us, and it's going to be good. Our job is to not let the adversary plant these ideas about things are falling apart, and they're not falling apart. This is a good bunch. If I could impart anything, it would be to give you confidence that you've got good people here. You've got gifted history that prepares you for the next phase. I thought about that, and the other part I add to that, the challenges that we face at First Lutheran Church are the same challenges that any church of any size, any denomination faces. A culture that is just in a swirl. Um, perfect time to be the church, to have that word of God's peace and acceptance, unconditional love. That's really the heart of, the, of Jesus' message it's going to be okay, more than okay. Follow me, trust me. I think about the name of, the tr of this church, and I think the name of this church, the formal name, presents both the challenges that you have in this day and age and also the opportunities. What do I mean by that? Well, first is the first part of the name, first. Now, first can mean we've been here 158 years. Let's just keep doing what we've done for 158 years. First can be a bad thing because it looks back. It can look back. Or it can be even worse. We're the first Lutheran church. We've been here. We're, we're planted. That, that can work against us because folks that aren't in here yet, they don't care that you were first. They don't care that you're 158 years old. They want to know, is Jesus here now? Is this a group of people that are accepting and excited and looking forward that doesn't mean to forget the past. I think it's incredible, and so should you. When you look at the people, that people are churches, how do we last 158 years? Well, because God had a purpose for this church, and you are the inheritance of that purpose. But if we just look back and say, let's just go back and do things the way we used to do and try to recreate 1950 again, it isn't going to happen. That doesn't mean there isn't a good mission ahead. So maybe instead of emphasizing, I don't hear this, well, I do hear it sometimes. We're First Lutheran, and all that has meant. Instead of thinking about First Lutheran, how about thinking about in what ways are we, uh, do we put God's word first, God's mission first? Maybe first is, our first priority is God's mission and Jesus and introducing people to Jesus, and whatever that takes and however appropriate, how do we connect people with Jesus and do Jesus' work, and be Jesus in the community. Be loving and joyful people, forgiving, welcoming, accepting. I think those are attributes of Jesus. How do we put that first? So use first in that way. Let's put Jesus in the mission first. Everything else is supportive of that. Transform the word first. Evangelical. Well, if I ask you to be on the church evangelism committee, you'll run quicker to that door as Lutherans. Nobody wants to be on the evangelism committee. Why? Because we think, oh, evangelism. Yeah, that's what those TV guys with women with the bouffant hairdos and the overly emotional pleas to send your money and then God will bless you. Manipulate your guilt. Not all of them are that way, to be sure. Billy Graham's an evangelist. I think he was an amazing guy. Not all of them. But you say the word evangelism now, and even Lutherans just kind of, tighten up. Well, we don't want to be the ones that go door to door and 
coerce people and threaten them. And we don't want to be like those folks that do that coercive uh, evangelism. It's just a word that's going to be hard to redeem. And even though our church is the evangelical Lutheran church in America, we find ourselves kind of on the defensive. Well, we're not that kind of evangelist, so therefore we chuck the word. The word is a good word. It means the good news of Jesus Christ, but it's a little hard to put that in a name. First, the good news of Jesus Christ, Lutheran Church. Evangelism, the word, is, works against us. I'm not saying that you should change the name. Please don't misunderstand me there. But, so that works against us, evangelical. It's a good word, but it works against us. The third word should be safe. It's Lutheran. You ask most young people, most people, oh, tell me, you know who Martin Luther is? Oh yeah, he's that dude that did the civil rights stuff. He's cool, I like Martin Luther. No, that's Martin Luther King. Oh, okay. Even Lutherans in our church don't, oh, Martin, oh yeah, that's right, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. But see, it's an understandable and okay mistake in my view. I think Martin Luther King Jr. was an incredible Christian leader. That's what he was. He wasn't a political leader although it had political implications. Uh, he wasn't a PhD, although he had that. He was a pastor that felt a calling to bring people together and nonviolently. Most of people don't know this. I wish they did, they don't, that Martin Luther King Jr.'s father was born Martin King Sr. And Martin King Sr. went on a Luther tour to Germany and discovered the heart of the Protestant Reformation in Martin Luther that we are saved by grace alone through faith. That you can't earn it, that it can't be taken away from you. It's a promise from God in Christ. That's the heart of the Lutheran message. And he loved that message and was so convicted by that that he came home and he legally changed his name. Martin Luther King Jr. A uh, King Senior. And then his son, Martin Luther King Jr. Because of Martin Luther. Most culture wouldn't know anything about Martin Luther. And you know what? Maybe Lutheran is a name that's just not going to be very easy to redeem. But what we can say is, well, Martin Luther was about God's grace. And it's unconditional. It's a free gift. You can't earn it, etc. That's the heart of Martin Luther's ministry. Don't look to Martin Luther. Look to the heart of his ministry. And the more you read about him and... and uh, <clears throat> his publications. There's more about him, of course, but if they only know that about Lutherans, but the name Lutheran doesn't convey much to anybody, and if anything, at least it's Martin Luther King that it conveys. Again, not a bad thing. So you got Lutheran. A lot of churches are Lutheran, but they pull the Lutheran part of their name out. Not because it's a bad thing at all, it's a good thing, but it takes too much explaining. My dear friend who was a Catholic priest is a Lutheran pastor at Messiah Lutheran in, on Cottage Grove Road. Jeff Vanden Heuvel is an incredible pastor. The church is growing, bursting at the seams because they're doing really good ministry for Christ. Their website is called messiahchurch.com. I don't know if they took out the Lutheran part, but I think a lot of churches are saying, yeah, we're Lutheran, but just putting Lutheran on the sign is not necessarily helpful. I like having Lutheran in the name, but we have to recognize that not everybody's gonna find that to be a real draw to our church. Doesn't mean we aren't Lutheran, but things we need to think about. And the final word seems safe, church. Except that you say to church, to, to unchurched people, they go, oh, those are those people that are boring and judgmental and they, you know, they hate gay people and they, you know, they're stingy. I don't know what words, but church is not a positive word to a lot of people. There's a book that I've referenced before. It's not a very good book, but it's got a great title and a great theme. It's called, They Like Jesus, But They Don't Like the Church. And the whole book is about people asking, tell me about your about church and Jesus. Well, Jesus, I think, is the greatest human being that ever lived. Jesus is even the son of God, but I don't expect I'd find him in a church. Church and Jesus don't go together for a lot of people. It pains me to say that because I say that's not my experience. Not at all. But it doesn't matter what I think, it's what people who aren't here are thinking. Church, bad, boring, judgmental, whatever else you can say negative. Almost everything that an unchurched person who doesn't want anything to do with the church will say is negative about the church. I mean, that's a little strong, I know, but you know, if I want to find Jesus, I'll go in the mountains. Well, I go in the mountains too. I see Jesus. I see Jesus 
in broken, hungry, angry people too. Jesus is everywhere and our job is to be Jesus for other people. Sometimes it happens within the building of a church, but that's not even the main place. I'm all for church. I'm all for First Evangelical Lutheran Church, but those can be barriers. Fortunately, we don't have to rest on those laurels. We say, you know what, we've got people and history and faith. We pray. We're looking at what Jesus is calling us to do. We want to be on Jesus' side and say, how can I be like Jesus? How can I be you know, at peace and joy when I'm out in a community and doing things that are not what people expect from church people? I see it all the time, by the way, and all in, in y'all. I'm going south, so I got to practice my y'alls. It's happening, but you know, we just need to be reminded, Paul says, just come together, come together. One of the, uh, so, so that, I guess that would be my final message. This is a good congregation with lots of challenges no different than any other church, lots of advantages that churches don't have, and lots of um, things to think about when you have 158-year-old history. Things aren't going to change overnight, and some things shouldn't change overnight. Some things need to change in all of our churches, and we're no different than the evangelicals who seem to be bursting at the seams. I mean, if anything, and I wouldn't trade places with them. You don't need to trade places. Just be yourselves. That's all. Have confidence with faith is what that means. So it's been a joy to be here, it really has. But um, God, God, God called me not back into retirement, which didn't last more than two weeks, but to New Orleans, Louisiana. It's a longer story than I have to share, but it literally came out of right field or left field, depending on whether you played right field or left field. I was a center fielder, so maybe that's for, but it, uh, call came and, and the bishop said, you have a son in Houston, don't you? I have a, a position near where your son is. It was in Houston and he described it and I said, it doesn't sound like me, thank you. But you call back when you have one that sounds like me and three days later he said, I have a position for you. It's close to your son in Beaumont, Texas. How close? Oh, it's just a couple hours. Oh, okay, where's that at? New Orleans. It's four hours away, but it's close. And he described the situation and you know what the first thing he said was? You know, one challenge, he says, this is a good congregation. It's one of our large congregations, half the size of this one. He says, not like Wisconsin, but this is the South. There aren't any ELCA churches down there, which helped me think, yeah, we need a good, strong Lutheran church down there in New Orleans for all those Midwesterners who come down to sin. That's what we need it for. We need a Lutheran presence. When they go down there, they can come on Sunday. No, not really, but... but um, so he said, here's your first assignment. They have four services and they have one pastor. They used to have two and three pastors. They have one pastor. You've got to figure out, pastor can't do all those and do other ministry. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like a very similar. It's a hard, they're challenging. We've got to be more resourceful with our, but that literally was the first thing I said, yeah, well, <laughs> that's not where I'm going to start, believe me. So October, I said, I can't start till October. We're going to Europe, and he said, fine. This pastor came 13 years ago, just retired two weeks ago. His first day, Katrina, first day. What was he thinking? I don't know where he was before. My God, what did you have in mind? Here I am when we're flooded out. So he stuck around for 13 years. Anyway, I get to go pick up that, and my I, invitation is just sincere. We know nobody down there. It's not home, but please come down and visit. One of the reasons we tell our friends that we're doing this is so that you can get away from the winter and come down and have a good time in New Orleans and then come to church on Sunday at Christ the King Lutheran in Kenner, Louisiana, which is, about, which is where the airport is, about 20, miles from, 20 minutes from the city. So please do come down, but um, please know that God has a purpose for your lives. You, Pastor Bob is PB, PB. I'm going to train you, PB. He's a, he's a chill guy. He and I are become friends in a short time, completely opposite. And, of course, as I told him, oh, Mary's not here. The only bad thing is he graduated from St. Olaf. Those people are unsufferable. Anybody here from St. Olaf? Yeah, no, you know, I don't mean that. We were envious. I went to lowly Pacific Lutheran out in Tacoma. No, but he's, he's, uh, he was at Faith Lutheran in Columbus for 30 plus years. Really good, faithful, 
wise pastor friend, and he and I are going to be together and pass the baton. So God's, you know, God's in charge. And the best compliment you can have in six months, say, who was that guy that was here last year? Can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, we, he, his sermons are too long. That would be a real compliment. Move on. May the peace of God in Christ, which passes human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ. Amen.